Good. It's gone. Excellent. So there's no more pizza. You have no other options but to hang out and watch me talk. So uh, my name's Omer Tryman. I work at a company called Cloudera. Uh, just a quick show of hands. You heard Cloudera before this talk. Yeah, just checking. Um, and uh, we do four things. Uh, we spend a lot of time building Hadoop. Uh, about half of our engineering goes to contributing uh, free open source software to the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, we train people on Hadoop. Clutter University is how thousands of people learn about Hadoop. Uh, we have classes uh, around the world, including in Boston. Um, Clutter.com, you can uh, keep an eye out and learn about it. Uh, we help people get started with Hadoop. We provide architectural services. Uh, what use cases are good for Hadoop? Uh, how do I set up my cluster? How do I build a process and team around Hadoop? Um, and we provide a subscription, uh, sort of Red Hat style. It offers uh, management software, it offers support, it's a helpline, it's a knowledge base, everything you need to run Hadoop in production. Um, I'm responsible for our training and services. I work a lot with customers. The group I'm responsible for is called Customer Solutions. And I thought it'd be interesting to talk about customer use cases. What do people actually do with Hadoop? Um, you've heard a few of them. One of the things I found fascinating when I talk to people who uh, are just starting to learn about uh, Hadoop is that it's actually present in a lot more places than you think. Uh, you actually are affected by Hadoop, involved with Hadoop, uh, sort of touching Hadoop or touched by Hadoop uh, every day. Uh, many of you now, as you peer at your mobile devices and phones, uh, it, it's actually in a lot of places. So I was going to highlight a few of them that are, in particular, I find interesting. Also, also uh, please interrupt me with questions. Uh, happy to take those uh, during the talk. So uh, we think about Hadoop across two core use cases uh, when we talk about this abstractly. Uh, we talk about advanced analytics, and we talk about data processing. Now, if you notice, when you look at different industries, those have different terms. People talk about, for example, content optimization in the media serving industry. They're actually talking about advanced analytics, but from a business perspective, what they're solving is content optimization problem. Uh, along similar lines, uh, in the financial space, um, when you uh, execute a trade, you go to uh, you know, eTrade.com or, or uh, Fidelity or, or some other site, um, that trade doesn't just get executed, it actually goes through about a dozen different systems that figure out the best place to place the, uh, the order, it gets bundled, and then it gets partitioned up, and there's a whole slew of algorithms that are applied to it. The reconciliation process, piecing that back together in order to show you what actually happened, being able to audit that, um, that's data processing. All right, has a couple of examples. So I'm going to go through uh, five of them. Uh, that, uh, that I think are interesting. Uh, so hopefully uh, some of you involved in this, Boston, of course, a, a hotbed for uh, life sciences. Um, there's an interesting problem, a good problem in genomics, which is that the cost and pace of uh, DNA sequencing, uh, that, that equation is starting to flip. The cost of sequencing is dropping. The rate at which you can sequence is going through the roof. In fact, it's growing up, uh, growing so quickly that um, it, these companies are having a hard time just capturing the data, never mind actually analyzing and being able to do something with it. Uh, every year you can buy a sequencer that's going twice as fast as the year before, and it's cheaper. And so uh, if you're not familiar with how sequencing works, basically, um, you know, people take sort of a, a bunch of DNA, it kind of looks like snot in a tube, and uh, they break it up, and they break it up in some reasonably well-defined fashions. Uh, and then figure out what those, uh, what those chunks were, but they don't come in in order. And so the very first thing uh, that needs to happen is actually figuring out uh, how those are aligned and matched. Uh, and when you have small numbers of sequences or small DNA, you can do it on one machine. As soon as you have a lot of them, you need a lot of machines. And Hadoop is very useful at that problem. It's got a lot of machines. Each one of them can take a little bit of the data and start piecing that together. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing that we found in the genetic space is actually there's a bunch of libraries out there. Um, this isn't something that people need to invent from scratch. So if you are a, a biologist, if you're a scientist who's dealing with this data, um, there's a few things that I've listed here on the slide. First of all, uh, all the native uh, formats actually can be read by Hadoop directly. Um, you don't need to reinvent the wheel there. So you can plug those into existing uh, utilities and system processes that you have today. There's also um, a lot of genomic tools that are available. Um, so this is actually a pretty vibrant area in terms of using Hadoop uh, to start handling the, these vast uh, quantities of data. 
what they do with it once they process it is stuff that you have to go work at these companies to find out, which I encourage you to do. They're doing really cool things. Um, this one, uh, when I came across it, and actually it's on our blog, um, it kind of came out of left field. It's a very interesting uh, use case. This is a, a company that basically does, organization that does biodiversity indexing. And you don't necessarily think of this as, as a big data problem. They actually collect uh, manually transcribed uh, notes uh, from researchers um, and then provide a free open service uh, to allow people to uh, look at uh, basically the, um, the life on this planet. Um, the whole process of collection, search, discovery, access to data is all driven uh, primarily by Hadoop. Um, they do uh, various kinds of data matching and cleansing, so the data comes in kind of messy, identifying different geographies. Uh, simple things, latitude and longitude, are uh, mixed up, so you've got palm trees in the middle of the ocean. Uh, that kind of swapping and detecting, data cleansing, data quality, uh, they apply Hadoop to do all of that, uh, as well as build out structured dictionaries and taxonomies. Um, it's great to collect the data uh, with a loose set of rules. You get a lot more people involved. You can get a lot more accuracy in the data. But it's very hard to search on that. Um, you know, if you search in your own uh, email, you might find terms that you're familiar with in identifying uh, documents or subjects. But other people might use different terms. Same thing when they're using field workers to, uh, to collect different kinds of data. Uh, they need to match these and create uniform dictionaries and taxonomies. So Hadoop is actually used to do that as well. Um, they, uh, they use a few different tools. I'm not going to go into details on these, except to point out they've got uh, amusing and funny names. Um, one is Scoop. It stands for SQL to Hadoop. If you use databases today and you're interested in moving data to and from Hadoop, Scoop makes it incredibly easy. You basically put in a command line. You say, uh, there's my database. I want it in Hadoop. Scoop does it, and vice versa. It's a great way to, to get started. It's how they actually move data into Hadoop from the databases they use to collect the data and then move it back out to a database for analysis and presentation. Uh, some of the uh, future development they're looking at is actually employing uh, a tool that Jeff mentioned called HBase, um, where uh, they can use to actually crawl the data and serve it. This is one uh, we came across uh, about a year ago. Um, if you're not familiar with seismic data analysis, it's a very I.O. intensive uh, process basically uh, involves uh, either on land, uh, satellite imagery, often uh, in the sea, it's boats basically with sensors dragging behind them, um, gathering more data than you can imagine. Uh, most of the data actually gets thrown out. They can't actually capture it fast enough. That process of capturing the, the raw data, which is uh, multidimensional, right, that there's sort of the, the latitude, longitude where you are, there's the depth, there's the time at which you collected it, um, and a few other things that are beyond me from a math perspective. Um, that's pretty complex to transform into models that people can actually look at to analyze what the, the Earth looks like. Uh, in many cases, this is for discovery of natural resources. And so you want to have a very clear picture of, uh, of what these things uh, mean. Um, there's actually um, some uh, great, uh, very well and, and um, easy to use programs, uh, things that, that people do today in school uh, in, uh, when they're studying geophysics, that you can actually put into Hadoop uh, and use to process this. Hadoop has a mechanism where you can basically call out to any program for a given line of data, um, and you can just plug that in. It's called Hadoop Streaming. Um, and that file format, the, the Seismic Unix file format, uh, can actually be easily transformed and processed in Hadoop. Uh, the potential here is taking volumes of data that would take order of magnitude a year to actually process from collection until those models are ready, and turning that into something that can actually happen in days or weeks, uh, just by applying uh, massive amounts of compute with local storage in order to solve those problems. Um, there's a few different uh, libraries that I've pointed out here as well. If Seismic is your thing, I encourage you to look at that. If Seismic isn't in your thing, nor genetics, uh, whatever your thing is, take a look and there's probably some Hadoop going on uh, around it. Uh, or come after and, and ask me. Uh, this one you probably have all seen. If you don't actually know it, uh, you've all been subjected to it. Uh, when you go on the web and uh, someone says, uh, hey, this is something that I think you'd be interested in. You say, wow, how did you know that? I was just shopping for 
you know, a rain jacket and you'd offered me boots. Um, that's not by accident. Uh, so this concept of the checkout lane where uh, supermarkets entice you to buy the things that you, know, you kind of might be interested in as you're waiting to check out, um, that doesn't happen so much on the web today. You do have the web space, but you can basically do you know, one-click checkout and, and have your item. What does happen is you continue to browse. And when you continue to browse, people can actually track what you're browsing. Uh, they use cookies, they use advertisements. Basically, if, you, if you're willing to uh, buy something from someone or get content for free, you're probably giving up some information about yourself. Um, and companies take advantage of this to help and try and target different kinds of advertisements that you might be interested in. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about this is it's not as brute force as saying that someone who bought a toy that needs batteries uh, uh, also might be interested in buying batteries that match that. The uh, timing behavior, purchasing behavior is actually time sensitive. Um, so uh, for example, you may not need batteries because they're included, but the average duty cycle on the toy is uh, you know, a week if it's a kid's toy, and then they need new batteries. And so maybe you should wait and target them in a week. Or if there's something that, that they need to replenish, right? So there's, there's interesting uh, analysis that you can do with this that has to do with the product, with consumption models, with the buying behaviors that help people identify when and where and how to target you if, if there's still a, a sense of where you are. Um, and that, that actually, uh, another interesting thing that um, I did not talk about on this slide, uh, it doesn't actually have to be tracking you as an individual. Uh, what companies are interested in is identifying who you might be and what you might be doing. So they don't need to know from a cookie or an ad that you are the one who bought a toy. They need to know that the browsing behavior you exhibit means that you are likely someone who may have bought that toy. Because you see tons of advertisements, so they're trying to hit you statistically with ones that, that might entice you. And then if you are enticed, now they know who you are again. So it's, it's interesting analysis there. Um, this one in particular, um, what I like about this use case is it's a use case in Hadoop where data isn't just loaded and batched and then analyzed and batched. They actually collect this data incrementally. So as you're browsing a site, as you're browsing the web, um, and processing on a variety of timescales, looking at the data that just arrived and saying, does it relate to something that happened uh, a few seconds ago, to something that happened yesterday, is it something that you did a few months ago, um, and continuously doing that kind of uh, um, temporal analysis to see uh, who you are, who you might be, and what you might be interested in. Um, some of these events naturally associate, um, uh, you know, same person clicking on uh, two different ads at the same time. Some of them require a much deeper analysis. Um, for those of you who, who are sort of in the science and math uh, space, if you're debugging uh, these kinds of algorithms, they use uh, HBase, uh, again, to do this. It, uh, it makes it a little bit easier. You can kind of see state of an algorithm um, in the middle. So um, be wary of what ads you look at and track and click on. Uh, and I think this is the last use case. Um, so recommendations and forecasting are another uh, interesting one. Um, uh, I guess we've heard a little bit about that uh, today. Uh, but basically this, this constant of, uh, concept of personalization. Um, today, uh, everything needs to be personalized. It's people you may know on LinkedIn, it's friend to a friend on Facebook, um, it's the advertisements that are there. Uh, Facebook doesn't show you, for example, all of your feed. They show you the feed that they think you might be interested in. When you go to Amazon's front page, they're going to show you things that you might be likely to buy. Um, so this, uh, this is actually used extensively. Anytime you're getting personalized content, uh, there's a very good chance that Hadoop's actually the plumbing behind that. Um, and the, the big challenge is that there's a, a wide variety and actually increasing variety of data that's used to access that personalization. Uh, it may not just be a static category as it once was, where you are a certain type of person, a certain age range, a certain class, um, you know, a certain income level, a certain demographic. Uh, this is something that sites are continuously analyzing, and Hadoop lets them do that. Uh, they can constantly import new data sources and try and reclassify and re uh, uh, reassess who you might be like, and then personalize to uh, to what they think you're like. And if they're wrong adjust based on that feedback. 
Um, some interesting things, um, so uh, poorly formatted data exists everywhere. Uh, people misspell things all the time, it can screw up your classification. And so that kind of data quality and data filtering is an important step in the process. Um, as well as normalization, you get different time scales, you have different ratings, you get different ratios. Uh, and if you're trying to combine different data sources in order to understand what category someone fits in, you need to make sure you're talking about the same thing, not one, uh, you know, one metric and, and one imperial. Um, interpretation is also interesting. Um, uh, Jeff Hammerbach, who, who Jeff spoke about earlier, uh, talks about this as uh, feature engineering, right? This concept that uh, if you are uh, interacting with a person, you don't know their gender, but you need to know their gender in order to target them with a the product, um, you can probably guess. Right? If you know their first name, you can guess in many cases. Um, so that, that's kind of a, a, an example, and you can start looking around and you're thinking about this and trying to realize that uh, there's a lot of things that you can guess uh, about, and, and if you guess enough about enough of them, you get a lot of these different features, you get a more accurate picture of who someone might be like. Um, aggregation across these likely matches is also obviously a, a complex problem. Um, and then uh, finally, it's, it's the predictable attributes. What is it that distinguishes a person? So these are, if you're familiar, familiar with statistics, these are pretty classic problems, basic algorithms uh, for doing uh, categorization content analysis. Uh, Hadoop basically allows you to do them at whatever scale you can collect your data. That's what I had today in terms of use cases. I don't know if we have Time for questions, or if you want to come up and uh, and ask me afterwards, but I'm happy to take a few until someone steals the microphone. Everyone got everything they needed. Yeah, uh, they'll be posted and they're being recorded. And there's a Google guy. Uh, where's the greatest demand that you're seeing right now for Cloudera? Uh, where's the greatest demand we're seeing for Cloudera? Um, I'd say we're seeing a ton in retail. It's become a very hyper-competitive space. Um, at the uh, eBay's keynote at Hadoop World, they talked about um, this trend that you now see when people go into, uh, they go shopping. Um, you can just scan the barcode and you know Amazon, eBay, everyone else will tell you how much you could pay for it somewhere else at a store nearby or how much it is with shipping to get it tomorrow. And so uh, all these things actually I've been talking about, identifying who someone is, what they're likely to buy, why they may or may not be loyal to you as a brand, uh, and what I can entice them with, maybe even before they go shopping, before they go in comparison shop, before they all tab. Um, that's a very critical area in, in terms of adoption. Um, we're definitely seeing financial services and, and life sciences as well. Advertisement, it's everywhere. Um, every, I mean, you see an ad, um, you're, you're, there's probably some Hadoop in the pipeline. Um, so those are probably the, the top ones. So the uh, question is, I talked about the input, I talked about the output, um, I didn't say anything about the algorithms, how complex are they? Uh, they can be incredibly simple. Um, they can be uh, as complex as you imagine them to be. We usually encourage people to start simple. Uh, take a look at the data, look at a bit of it, uh, uh, pose a hypothesis, uh, and try to match based on that hypothesis. Um, that's your starting point, and then you, you actually and it might be 10 minutes between cycles, but you, you explore and you learn about your data. That's where the, the science part of data science comes from. So if you have two data sources and they have two different types of user IDs, and you think you know what the matching algorithm that aligns one user ID with the other is, try it, run it, Hadoop, it'll be a matter of minutes, and then you'll know. Um, and you'll actually know what the outliers are, you know what the right answers are, you know what the wrong answers are, and you can see how far off you are. It might be interesting to do some analysis on the difference of the data set, um, or they might, uh, none of them might match, which gives you may have a bug. Right? But you start with something simple um, and grow from there. And there, there are now increasingly uh, a number of libraries that you can apply to do this. There's a project called um, um, Mahout that is uh, M-A-H-O-U-T, for folks taking notes. Um, that collects a lot of different types of algorithms. It does a k-means clustering, it does a naive base, and you can actually take the algorithms that it has 
uh, format your data and, and apply those algorithms, and they, they run on Hadoop. Seed control of the mic. Thank you all very much.